Have you ever bought a tool or a device that you did not use to its full potential, but you didn't realize it until much, much later? Maybe it was a piece of technology, a phone or a watch, a computer, or maybe it was a program, or maybe you got a new smart TV and you never actually hooked it up to the internet to know all the things that it does. There have been times in my life where I bought something and I thought it was a great purchase, and then months or maybe even years later I realized it could do exponentially more than what I even realized, and I wasn't utilizing all of the benefits and blessings of that particular device or tool or program. One example is with my iPhone. I was told, it was actually fairly recently within the last three months, that my iPhone can take 4K videos if I change the setting within there and ultra high def photos as well. And you think, well, I don't really care about that. I don't need to take 4K videos. Well, here's the thing, is that last September I went to Israel and I took videos of all the places that I was and pictures and I didn't know that I could have been taking 4K videos that entire time. And so now, whenever I look at them, they're really clear, but I think they could be even like twice as clear and beautiful and awesome as what they are right now. And if I would have known that my iPhone had that potential, my photos and my videos of Israel would be that much better. Now today we're continuing our series called Untapped Potential. And we're talking about the Holy Spirit living inside of each and every Christian and how that gives us untapped potential. And just as I didn't know all the features of my iPhone, there are probably still other things that I'm not even aware of that I can do with it. There, are, there is untapped potential inside each and every Jesus follower each and every Christian that we're not even aware of and we don't even know is at our disposal. There is a source of power that we aren't always aware of. Now we've talked the last couple of weeks about kind of just a general introduction and last week we talked about kind of who the Holy Spirit is and his identity and this week we're going to be in uh, John chapter 16 if you've got a Bible, John chapter 16 verses 7 through 15. And we're going to spend a couple of weeks talking about what the Holy Spirit actually does. When we say, like, Jesus is God with us, and the Holy Spirit is God in us, what does God in us actually do? Well, this section begins in the beginning of chapter 16 with Jesus trying to comfort his disciples about what's about to happen. And in the midst of that conversation, he says in verse 7, this. He says, but very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the advocate, which is the Holy Spirit, the advocate will not come to you, but if I go, I will send him to you. Now we probably wouldn't imagine that it's good for us if Jesus leaves planet earth. Like if we were to take a poll and I were to ask the question, would you rather have Jesus on earth right now or would you rather have the Holy Spirit living inside of every believer? I would imagine that we would mostly say, yeah, I think I want Jesus on earth. Because we need some Jesus. And maybe Jesus could run for president of the United States. I know he's not necessarily a citizen, but I, he could probably find a workaround. Like if we could have Jesus as our president or Jesus as our world leader, like we would say, yeah, I want Jesus here. And Jesus says, it's for your good that I'm going away. Because when I go away, <clears throat> I'm going to send the Advocate, or the Holy Spirit, to live inside of each and every believer, and this is how the church is going to expand, and it's going to take off, and it's going to move. Like, God with us, <laughs> what an incredible thought, that Jesus came as God in the flesh, but what we need to realize is that God in us, there's some pretty amazing things that happen there as well. Now, as we walk through the rest of this little section, through the verse 15, what we will see is that Jesus explains to the disciples basically three areas of the Holy Spirit's ministry. This, is, this isn't the only three areas, but these are the three that he brings up in our conversation today. And we're going to talk about each of these three areas, unpack them a little bit, and then I'm going to ask you a question after each of these little mini sections that we cover to figure out, are we living with this, with this untapped potential, or 
are we just kind of going through the motions, taking videos in like standard definition when we could be taking them in 4K? The first aspect or area that the Holy Spirit has very real ministry is how he interacts with the world. The world being <coughs> those outside of the Christian experience and those outside of the Christian faith. So continuing with our passage, verse 8, he says this. When he comes, that is the Holy Spirit. When he comes, he will prove the world to be wrong about sin, righteousness, and judgment. And then Jesus tells us how those things will take place. He said, with regards to sin, because people do not believe in me. About righteousness, because I am going to the Father, where you can see me no longer. And about judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. And you may be like, I have no idea what Jesus is talking about here. What, how is that a benefit or a blessing to us? Well, I'm going to, at the risk of oversimplifying it, here's what Jesus is saying. Holy Spirit is going to convict the world of sin. They don't believe in Jesus. Most people don't think they need to believe in Jesus because they don't think that they're a bad person. Like you've seen the videos where I think the guy's name is Ray Comfort, and I'm not pick it on this guy, but don't, do not do this, okay? But he'll go up to people randomly and say, and he's from New Zealand, so he has kind of a weird accent, right? And so he's like, do you believe you're a sinner? And the person's like, no, I, I don't. I mean, what would you do if somebody just randomly came up, do you think you're a sinner? No, have you ever lied before? Uh, yeah, I've lied before. Well, did you know that lying is sin? Uh, I guess it is. So let me ask you again, are you a sinner? And people are like, ah, uh, it's like a big gotcha moment, right? Now listen, if I'm driving through Woodlawn, and I see you walking around with a camera crew and a microphone, I'm going to ask you to stop doing that. And if you will not stop doing it, then I'm going to give you a First Baptist Church of Woodlawn t-shirt to wear while you go do it, okay? I'm teasing. I wouldn't do that. It'd be a central Christian church shirt, actually. No, I wouldn't do that either. But like, you know, I don't think it's our job to try to get people in a gotcha type of moment, because I think that gets people defensive and more combative and debative as opposed to, let's have a conversation because you're my friend and I love you and I want what's best for you. But nonetheless, the point that Ray Comfort brings out in all of his videos is clear and I think it's true. People generally think that they themselves are good. And who's the bad person? Well, a person who's a little bit worse than I am. I'm a good person. Not that they would say that they're the standard of good, but they would generally think, I'm a good person, I'm not sinful. So the Holy Spirit comes in part to convict the world of sin to kind of show <clears throat> that there is a need for a Savior. Jesus says they don't believe in me. The Holy Spirit has to come convict them of sin so that they will desire a relationship with me, so that they recognize that they are sinful. He says, with regards to righteousness, because I'm going to the Father, which is to say, you're not going to be able to look at me anymore and follow my example. Now, obviously, we have the written word, and obviously, we have kind of the, the testimony of the church as to who Jesus is and the way that he lived, but when he leaves, we can't bring anybody to Jesus and say, I know you think you're righteous or that you think you're a good person, but Jesus is kind of the example, and anything below him is unrighteousness. And it's sinfulness. And so since Jesus is going to the Father, and he won't be there as the example for what godly living is going to look like, the Holy Spirit will convict people's hearts, not only to sin, but also with regards to righteousness, with go hand, which go hand in hand, and then also in terms of judgment. That we believe that we will spend forever somewhere either in God's presence or away from God's presence. And we also believe that we are the ones who get to decide that. That God gives free will to the world, that God gives the freedom of choice to all people, and they will either throughout their lives choose to reject Jesus or choose to follow Jesus, but the decision is up to them. But it's this idea that judgment is eventually coming for all people, and we will not escape it. We will not get around it. Now, the way that the Holy Spirit does this, I believe, is through the preaching and teaching and conversations about His Word and about godly things, and He will use our conversations, our actions, our activities, and give them like a special boost so that there's more impact in what we do because of His power behind it. The best example of this is Acts chapter 2. 
the day of Pentecost and the birth of the church. And we've talked about this the past couple of weeks. And in our conversations, we see that Peter ends up standing up and giving the conclusion of this sermon. You remember how many people were baptized? Hopefully you read the book of Acts this week. Not three, even though that'd be a good Sunday, right? 3,000 people were baptized on the day of Pentecost. Without the Holy Spirit working in the hearts and the minds of the people that were listening, that number's drastically different. There aren't 3,000 people getting baptized that day. And so what we see <clears throat> as the Holy Spirit moves not only in the words of the apostles, particularly Peter, but also in the hearts and the minds of people, <clears throat> the work that they do is exponentially greater. Because the Holy Spirit is working to convict people of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Now here's the thing about it. <clears throat> is that the Holy Spirit works, I don't believe, apart from our activity as Jesus' followers. What I mean by that is, the Holy Spirit does not just appear in somebody's room in the middle of the night and then say, hey, just want to tell you who Jesus is and what it means to follow him. And you can choose to reject or you can choose to follow, but I'm going to lay out the plan right now Hopefully you got a couple minutes, you know, if you need to make a pot of coffee or whatever, because I just woke you up from a deep sleep, let's go ahead and do that. Holy Spirit doesn't do that. The Holy Spirit does not meet with people and say, here's how to follow Jesus. Who is supposed to do that? Us. And so I'm not saying that we handcuff the Holy Spirit or limit his power, but when we do not share our faith, and give an opportunity for people to hear about the gospel and hear about what Jesus has done in our lives and the benefit that there is to going to church and reading your Bible and praying. Like If we are not saying those things, then the Holy Spirit is not able to come and amplify our message because we're not giving a message. Like on the day of Pentecost, Peter preached. Well, imagine if he just would have sat there. Like, I'm already, I've already said, if the Holy Spirit didn't show up, there are not 3,000 people getting baptized. But what if Peter's like, nah, I don't really feel like it today. They may make fun of me, or they may think I'm weird, or what if they ask me questions I don't know the answer to? I'm not going to share my faith because, ah, if God wants them to be saved, they'll be saved. Somebody else will share. What if Peter just sat there and didn't say anything? I don't think that 3,000 people get baptized that day. Like, it, the Holy Spirit's going to do what he does but we partner with him, and he amplifies and strengthens our message. So he's working on the hearts and minds of the people in our lives. Your neighbors who don't know Jesus, your family members who don't know Jesus, your friends who don't know Jesus, your co-workers who don't know the people that are in your life that don't know Jesus. Maybe you hung out with them on Fourth of July weekend. The Holy Spirit is working on their hearts in this moment, and they don't even realize it. And what God is wanting us to do is to speak the truth in love and to share the good news of who Jesus is and what he's done for us. And so as the Holy Spirit works, we come alongside and we, we don't preach necessarily the way that we think of preaching, but we do proclaim the good news of Jesus. And then what happens as a result is that people oftentimes will find Jesus. Now remember, we still have free will. So this is not to say that the Holy Spirit's work on a person's life to convict them of sin, righteousness, and judgment trumps their ability to choose to either follow or reject. Like, that free will is given as a gift from God. So the Holy Spirit does not, you know, jump over a person's free will. But the Holy Spirit works... And in a lot of ways, his effectiveness is determined by our willingness to partner with him. So as you think about our world, and we can't think of our world. The world's a big place, lots of different countries. Let's just think about our nation for a moment. Do you think our nation is getting better or getting worse? I'm just trying to be as objective as possible. I would say, over the course of my 35 years... It would not be a stretch to say that we're probably going further away from God as opposed to closer towards Him. And the further you get away from God, the worse your, your, 
nation, your family, your school, everything. Everything gets worse. The further you get away from God, the worse off you are in terms of morality and morals and, and everything. Well, as we look throughout our nation, what is the problem? Is the Holy Spirit dropping the ball here? He's supposed to be convicted about sin, righteousness, and judgment. Was he taking a nap? What's going on? I think the problem isn't with him. I think it's with us. Now, the solution to this is not to make your own videos where you're interviewing people and trying to trick them. And, oh, I got you. The solution is also not to post a bunch of stuff on Facebook and try to debate people. The solution is that we try our best to be salt and light, which Jesus talks about, to the people who know us the best and that we know the best. That we influence the people that we love and that love us. And we use what God has done in our life as a testimony to what God can do in their lives. And so before we go into the next section, let me ask you a question that you're going to have to process through and answer on your own. The question is this, how are you partnering with the Holy Spirit as he works to convict the world of sin? The people that you love, that you're close to, that you have a relationship with, how are you partnering with the Holy Spirit? He's trying to convict their hearts and change their minds. He's not going to usurp their free will, but he's still working in their lives and what he wants from us is that we are willing to be that light, to share our faith, to uh, preach and teach about the good news of Jesus. And if we're not willing to do that, then what Jesus does in, our, or in their lives, they don't have anywhere to go. They have a compass that says you kind of need to get towards God, but we're the ones who are supposed to actually take them there. So, how are you partnering with the Holy Spirit as he works to convict the world of sin? Everybody has someone in their life that doesn't know Jesus. How are you being Jesus to that person who doesn't know who he is? And the Holy Spirit wants to work with you and partner with you to help them find a relationship with the Son of God. I want you to think about how you're doing that. Well, here's the second aspect as we kind of shift and transition to the second movement. The second aspect or movement of the Holy Spirit's ministry is with the disciples. And I would say by extension, ultimately us as well. Now next weekend, we're going to talk about spiritual gifts and how that looks like and how that plays out in the life of the church. But Jesus talks about some of the work that, that the Holy Spirit has within the followers of Jesus. And he says this in verses 12 and 13. Jesus says to the disciples, I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. Here's the reason that I highlight these, these different sections. When you read the Gospels, the disciples, the disciples get it wrong more than they get it right. And they look like cowards, and they look juvenile, and they argue over petty things. Like, it's like Jesus picked the worst possible guys that he could pick, and they act like knuckleheads all throughout the Gospels. And when Jesus is teaching them different things, they're like, Jesus, can you explain this? We don't get the parable. Jesus is like, you don't get this parable? How are you going to? This is, this is like one-on-one stuff. You're going to be the leaders of the church movement. My goodness, I've got some work to do. Cancel my... My lunch appointment, I was going to, but I need to work with you guys. Well, he says at the end of his ministry, and here's the thing, this is the last night of his life. This is the last supper. The clock is ticking down. But for Jesus, he's like, I've got much more to say to you. But he's not saying, man, I got a lot to say, but guys, we're running out of time. Let's just go ahead and, and do this thing. He says, I've got a lot to say to you, but you guys can't even handle it. You guys aren't even at the emotional, mental level or spiritual maturity to even be able to handle what I got to say to you because you can't even bear it. And you know why they can't bear it? Because they don't have the Holy Spirit yet. Jesus is like, I got so much to say to you, but it will freak you out on a level that I won't even be able to get you back. Well, I'm going to wait. I'm not even going to tell you this stuff yet. When the Holy Spirit comes 
and He lives inside of you, He will guide you into all the truth. When you have God in you, then you'll be able to hear and process all the persecutions that you're going to have to endure and the way that you're going to be <laughs> falsely testified against and falsely imprisoned and beaten and some of you shipwrecked, some of you beheaded, some of you tried to burn alive, crucified upside down. Like all of these Jesus followers were imprisoned and murdered because of their faith with the exception of Judas who committed suicide because of his betrayal of Jesus and John, the Apostle John, they tried to uh, cook him alive in a boiling pot. He didn't die. That freaked them out. They thought it was a bad omen, so they exiled him to the island of Patmos, where he wrote five letters of the New Testament. But whenever, like, if, if Jesus were to tell them that now, hey, Peter, you know you're going to be crucified upside down? Peter would probably be like, I'm out, I'm out, and just walk away. But... When you read the book of Acts, total shift, completely different men, completely different perspective, completely different way of living. Why? Because the Holy Spirit lived inside of them. And they were not only able to hear what was going to happen to them and hear how the church was going to expand and their part and all this stuff, but they were actually able to live it out as well. And then it says he will tell you what is to come which is to say with the apostles, and they had, a, they had a, a, a different place in the church movement than we do, but the apostles were shown things and taught things and experienced things that I think that you and I are not going to experience because it was the foundation of the church, it was the birth of the church, and it was a different time period than what we have now. But make no mistake that God in us is still a big, big deal. And just as I had 4K videoing capabilities on my phone that I didn't even know was there and I didn't even tap into. Think about the Holy Spirit living inside of you and how you may be trying to go through life with one arm tied behind your back spiritually. And if you really prayed and asked for God to show you or pray, asked for God to help you or asked for, for God to convict you or asked God to move in your life, like what do you think would change and what would happen? In fact, the question that I have after this section is, where does the Holy Spirit need to help you grow in your faith and understanding of God? Now, here's the thing about it, <clears throat> is I don't care how mature you are in your faith, I don't care how much you know about the Bible. Everybody's got something that they can answer here. Unless you have reached a level of perfection, and you no longer sin, and you no longer have issues or weaknesses or failures, if, if you would say, well, no, that's, that's where I'm at. I need you to talk me after service because I need you to tell me how you did it. Because I'm not there yet. But for everybody else, and if you're sinless and perfect, you don't even need to listen actually ever to me because you're beyond, I, I, I can't help you. <clears throat> but for everybody else, we, there's an area in our lives where we need to grow in faith. We may not even know what that is yet completely, and there are areas in our lives where we need to understand what it means to completely and totally follow God and what surrender looks like and how to completely and totally lay down our rights or even how we share our... I mean, there's so many things that we need to learn as Jesus followers. So what I'm asking for you to process through is, where am I weak or lacking or insufficient in my faith? And how can God help me to follow him or understand who he is or his will more closely? Now, this doesn't come by you taking a test or, you know, you watching a video and going, oh, I mean, this comes by you processing, looking inward and praying. And I believe that because the Holy Spirit lives inside of a Jesus follower, he will reveal to you areas that you need to work on and areas that he wants you to progress in. But you've got to be willing to be vulnerable and have that conversation with God. Where does the Holy Spirit need to help you grow in your faith and understanding of God? Now let's get to the final aspect of the Holy Spirit's ministry, the final area that we're going to talk about today. And it's how he interacts with Jesus. And it sets, it sets an example for us on how we're supposed to interact with Jesus as well. In fact, here's what Jesus says in verses 14 and 15. He says, he will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. 
All that belongs to the Father is mine, and that is why I said the Spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. So within the Trinity, there is total and absolute equality. So God the Father is not more God than the Son or than the Spirit. And God the Son isn't more God than God the Father or the Spirit. And they're not less or more. It's not like that. There is complete and total equality. Each of them are God in 100%. One God, three persons. But in order to bring salvation to mankind, each person of the Trinity takes a different role. So God the Father is identified kind of all throughout the Old Testament as Yahweh. And he's the one that they follow. God the Spirit is active and God the Son is active. But they identify their worship ultimately of God the Father. And God the Father doesn't come down the cross for our sins. God the Son does. Now it's still God. But God the Son comes in the flesh and he lives a perfect life, and he dies on the cross so that we can have forgiveness of sins. And then, God the Son doesn't come and live inside of us. That's why I always get, like when people say, accept Jesus into your heart. I get what they mean, but Jesus doesn't come into your heart. The Holy Spirit does. See, God the Spirit is the one who lives inside of us. And just as God the Father sends the Son to do his will and to live and to die... God the Son sends the Spirit to speak His truths and illuminate Him and help us see Him and identify Him more clearly and to understand His teachings in a better way. The Spirit amplifies all the work that the Son did. So it's not that He necessarily is doing new. He's pointing back to the person and work of Jesus, that He ultimately glorifies Jesus. And this is, leads me to my final question. How are you actively working to glorify Jesus? This is why we exist on planet Earth. And when we think about our lives and, and all that we do and all that we accomplish and, and all that we pursue, sometimes we pursue things that not only do they not last, but they're not good for us. They're not healthy for us. And sometimes they even bring us away from God. Like, our primary mission is to live a life that glorifies Jesus. That everything we do, everything we say, puts a spotlight on him and helps people see him more clearly, understand who he is, and that we model what it means to follow him. And in doing so, we will glorify Jesus. But sometimes, our wants, our desires, our wishes, they get in the way. And so I want you to think of an area of your life that you've kind of isolated. And it may not even be that you're doing anything wrong. I'm not saying like an area where you've got some hidden sin, even though if you do have those, like those need to be identified as well. But sometimes there are areas where we're more concerned with what we can get or what we can do or us getting ahead as opposed to glorifying Jesus. And when push comes to shove... When, when it's about glorifying Jesus or glorifying ourselves, when it's about lifting up our name as opposed to lifting up His, our default mode and how we are in our nature, we will lean towards lifting up ourselves and making our name great at the expense of Jesus. So the Holy Spirit comes into the world for the sole, sole purpose of glorifying Jesus. And by extension, we have God living inside of us. We are Jesus followers. We should live with this mindset as well. So how are you actively working to glorify Jesus? Now, as I mentioned to you next week, <clears throat> we're going to talk about spiritual gifts and more holistically what God does each and every day of your life, essentially, by equipping you to live out his mission on planet earth now the thing about spiritual gifts it, it kind of it makes people feel a little uncomfortable at times and I get that but here's here's my homework assignment for you okay I like getting homework assignments remember I was almost a math teacher and I think I missed the opportunity to give assignments to kids not that you're kids okay but here's my assignment for you I want you to read Romans chapter 12 1 Corinthians 12 13 and 14 
Four chapters. Now, last week, if you, if you did the book of Acts, awesome, number one. Number two, that was 28 chapters. All I'm asking for this week is four. This is basically a softball assignment, all right? Romans 12, then 1 Corinthians 12 through 14. These are the main spiritual gift passages that are present in Scripture. I want you to process through those, and I want you, as you are reading these chapters, I want you to make little notes or little questions that you may have. And here's what I really want you to do, because it's a big benefit to me as I'm going to prepare next week's sermon. I want you to ask me different questions that you have about spiritual gifts. And so it's going to talk about miracles. And like, well, you may wonder, do miracles still exist in the way that we see them? Like, do you think that, like, you could part the, the sea? Like, if I drop my fishing pole in the lake, you know, could, does somebody have the ability to spread it? Because it's an expensive fishing pole and I'd hate, you know, or whatever. Don't ask that question, by the way. That would be a little, a little ridiculous. But, like, there are some really good questions when you start talking about spiritual gifts. And I'll say this. I probably won't have really good answers to it. But at least we can have the conversation about it. So Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12 through 14. And as we end our service today, we want to set aside that time to remember what Jesus did when he died on the cross for our sins. So if you have your prepackaged communion cups, go ahead and peel back that first layer and expose the bread. And on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread gave thanks, and he broke it, and he gave it to them, saying, Take and eat of it, all of you. This is my body. And in the same way, he took the cup, and he gave thanks, and he gave it to them, saying, Take and drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Well, Father, we are so thankful for Jesus, for his life and example, for his death, burial, and resurrection, which not only gives us forgiveness of sins, it not only gives us eternity in your presence, but it also gives us your Holy Spirit living inside of us now. Father, continue to teach us and help us to understand what your Spirit living inside of us can do for us, how it can help us to live with more intentionality, with better strategy. Help us in all things to bring glory and honor to you. Help us to love you more tomorrow than we did today. And help us to love our neighbor as ourselves. Give us the strength to do these things, Father, as I know that you will. We lift all this up. We pray a blessing on it in Jesus' name. Everybody says, Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Thanks for being here today. We'll see you next weekend.